Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast 360. I'm Dr. Rob Dixon, and today, Dr. Casey Patrick and I of the podcast are going to do a piece on heat illness, hence why we are in podcast t-shirts, shorts, and sandals. So today, we're going to talk about the spectrum of heat illness, some of the signs and symptoms you should look for, and the appropriate approach to therapy for these patients. Obviously, an appropriate topic for discussion right now. It's been a monstrous heat wave here in Southeast Texas over the past couple weeks. And heat stroke is a deadly illness. It's a deadly illness that requires prompt treatment for best outcomes for our patients. And there are some, there are some myths out there, and we're introducing some new protocol specifics here at MCHD so we can better target our true heat stroke patients and look for the best recovery for our patients possible. So first, what is a heat stroke? Probably the best place to start. There are really two types of heat strokes. There are classic heat strokes, which occur in non-exertional settings. That's not really the patient population that we're gonna target with our protocol that we're gonna be discussing today. And then there's the second category of exertional heat strokes that occur with activity. Military, construction workers, most commonly athletes. The key to either group of heat strokes is temperature greater than, depending on where you look, the the definition gets a little murky. We've chosen 105 Fahrenheit here at MCHD, so 105 Fahrenheit is required for us to call heat stroke. Some other references look at 40.5 Celsius. We're gonna go with 105 Fahrenheit here at MCHD, plus altered mental status. So to qualify as heat stroke diagnosis, you have to be altered. So altered, greater than 105, with exertional history, qualify for the exertional heat stroke pathway, treatment pathway here at MCHD, hence the uh, ice coolers and the cooling bags that we have here on the stretcher. What are some of the myths? Let's talk about some of the myths as far as heat stroke treatment that can derail us from getting our patient promptly cooled. So what are some of the things that we have been taught, you and I were taught, that we should do that aren't necessarily true? Well, I hope this first one is a myth, Casey, because I'm getting ready to take the medical director's ice bucket challenge and prove to you that our equipment is fail safe here and it's ready to deploy. But one of the myths would be, if you immerse these patients, they're gonna have some ventricular dysrhythmia or it's going to cause a cardiac arrest myth. Yeah, that probably stems from hypothermia. And moving the severely hypothermic patient can stimulate dysrhythmia. Rapid cooling is the treatment key for heat stroke, period. So the more rapidly we can cool the patients, the better their outcomes are gonna be. Now we wanna shoot for about 38. So we wanna drop from 105 to about 101, somewhere in there. We don't wanna rapidly overcool but that doesn't really come into play when it comes to ventricular arrhythmias or maybe we want to try some groin and axillary ice packs maybe we want to try some misting or some IV fluids first all of those methods are slower than immersion quicker we can recool heat strokes the better their outcomes are if we need to add groin packs or IV fluids or misting then we can and if that's all you have, those are better than nothing. But if you have immersion available, which we're going to make available here on the trucks at MCHD, immersion should be your treatment of choice. And we'll put all these notes in the podcast on the background literature on this, the recent NAMSP position statement on it, and a link on where to get these cooling bags and where to source them. So a couple things just to, to wrap it up before we start the demonstration. Heat stroke, another myth. Uh, the absence or presence of sweating. You really shouldn't bother with that. You should look at, is it an appropriate clinical scenario for heat stroke, i.e. is the person out in the elements and generally in these patients is exertional, do they have a temperature, core temperature over 105, and do they have the most key thing, altered mental status? And that can include seizure as well. So appropriate clinical situation, Temp over 105, altered mental status. Your first go-to should be immersion cooling if it's available. Secondary is ice bags on the axilla, on the on the groin, 
cold fluids, and our usual supportive therapy that we do in EMS medicine. One last piece to hit on, you just said it, and that was core temp. If at all possible, we want, need a cold temp in these folks. In heat stroke patients, their homeostasis is obviously way out of whack. You have significant peripheral vasoconstriction oftentimes. So peripheral temperatures like axillary temperatures, if you have a temporal probe, for example, those can vastly underestimate the severity of hyperthermia. So a core rectal temperature, if at all possible, is key in these patients so we know the full extent of how hot they really are. So core really temp work. key, rapid immersion is key. Rapid immersion leads to better outcomes. Don't be afraid of icing patients. It's the treatment of choice. It's gonna lead us to the best outcomes. So exertion plus 105 or greater plus altered mental status equals heat stroke. Now let's try out our body bags and demonstrate for the medics, the watchers, the listeners out there. So our medics are on scene with a heat stroke patient. We've confirmed with our rectal thermometer a temperature of 105.5. The patient was outside uh, doing some marathon Ironman training and uh, cycling and running and collapsed and some bystanders found him here on the sidewalk. So we've got an altered patient with an exertional history and a temp of 105.5. So we're activating our MCHD heat stroke exertional immersion protocol. So our patient's on the, back, on the ground. Our immersion bag is out. We're gonna get the immersion bag open as close to the patient as possible. We've got our ice from our fire crew. The ice is gonna be on our FRO trucks. So we'll use all the ice that they have. So we're gonna tuck the patient, roll the bag up and under, as you can see. Captain Clay did it now. Now we've rolled the patient back onto the bag itself. And we can pull the other side out from under and tuck the legs in. The patient likely will not be terribly cooperative in this situation because again, True heat stroke requires temperature greater than 105 Fahrenheit, along with altered mentation. And for our immersion protocol, we have to have the additional exertional component as well. So we got the patient in the bag. We got the bag tied off. Now we can either use the scoop or not use the scoop, depending on the size of the patient, the situation, whether or not we need the scoop or not. We're going to go from the ground into the bag onto the stretcher, either with scoop or without. That's going to be dependent again upon situation and position. The bag does have loops and straps that you can use, as you can see Kathy Clay doing. Patient is now up, down a little bit. And the final key component of this protocol is that rapid immersion is the single most important piece. So we don't want to initiate transport until the patient is fully iced. So we get the ice into the bag. We want to go up to the chest. We don't want to, we don't want to have a drowning. So we've got the patient iced. If we have any water, water is key here because that's going to help dissipate the heat. So now we're initiating rapid cooling. We've got the bag in place and we're going to head for rapid transport at this point now that we've initiated immersion. If we need IV or IO access, that can be obtained at this time. If we need to use anti-emetic treatment, if we have any seizure activity and need to use benzodiazepines, all of these things are indicated and can be used per protocol. Oftentimes, mental status return can be very quick and very marked. Oh, it sounds like he's awake already. Our heat stroke patient is back.
Obviously, we want to give this information through Pulsera report or radio report, whichever we're using for our receiving institution, and make sure that our hospital partners know that a patient's coming immersed. So thanks again for watching this edition of the MTHD Paramedic Podcast 360. Thanks to our crew, Captain Travis Clay and our attendant, Jonna Gilson and Dr. Patrick uh, for narrating here. If you have any questions, please write us your questions, concerns at the podcast email podcast at mchd-tx.org.